stand with me. And this morning, uh, I'm excited to be home. Uh, Georgina and I have been traveling. We've been doing the work of the ministry. We've been uh, fulfilling not only our responsibilities, but really pursuing the plan of God in Victory Outreach. And we just came back from Panama. And what a powerful crusade in Panama. Um, Johnny and Evelyn went with us, Pastor John and Evelyn, and they're going to share a little bit about, about it tonight. But um, we had a powerful time. You know, the devil tried to hit us. The devil tried to stop that crusade in Panama. But how many know God is always faithful? God is always faithful. And there must have been at least 3,000 people there the night that we were there. It was amazing to see how many people in Panama are hungry. The church is exploding. In just 24 months, they already have 400 people. It's powerful. 24 months. And so God has raised up a powerful church there. And what's amazing about what's happening in Panama is that it's the team that God's using. You know, the Bible says he'll choose the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Well, when you look at that team there, you see a team that's young and experienced. They don't know much. You know, it's funny how experienced people can only do so much. But how many of God is looking not for experience? He's looking for willingness, openness, availability. And this team that's there, they're young. They're all under the age of 30. And God is using them in a mighty, mighty way. So keep Panama in prayer. Amen. But it's exciting to see what's happening here. I'll tell you, we were watching you guys. You know, back in the day when you were gone from a church, you'd have to call the associate pastor and say, hey, uh, Mr. Associate Pastor, how's the church doing? You know, and you'd say, well, this is the problem that's happening. And this service was good. And this is how many people were there. And, and this brother's sick. And this sister's acting up. And you get all that, right? But how many of you don't have to do that anymore? No, all you got to do is look at your phone. And you know everything that's going on in the church. You know the ones that are faithful. You know the ones that aren't faithful. You know the ones that have the victory. You know the ones that are defeated. Come on, somebody. And then you know the ones that are getting busy for God. And I think it was on Saturday, one of the days I looked over at Regina and I said, look at all the things our church is doing. They were at the hospital at Rady's, touching families. They were in the streets evangelizing. They were doing all kinds of things for the Lord. So I want to tell you, to be a part of Victory Outreach San Diego is not to be a part of a dead ministry. It's not to be a part of a church that you just come to church on Sunday, get fed, and go home. But how many know this is a church that's not only making an impact in San Diego, but how many know we're making an impact all over the globe? Oh, man, I want to be a part of a church like that. Even in, even in South Africa, we had Daniela here, right? And, and you think about what God is using Sammy and Daniela to do in South Africa. You think about El Cajon. El Cajon's exploding. Great things are taking place at Victor Arch El Cajon. I was also in West Sacramento with Gary and April. And you know, they just got a big building. They finally got their building, a beautiful building there in, in, in West Sac. So how many know that that's the type of ministry God has called us to be a part of? Then look at the gang. Ooh, things are exciting. How many want to be a part of a ministry that's exciting? And uh, I come home to a church that's not dead, but I come to a church that is alive and looking good, y'all. You guys been dieting or what's going on? Some of you bought some new clothes. You're looking sharp. Amen. Look at you every time you look sharp this morning. So it is exciting to be in the house of the Lord. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to open them with me to the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. And I have a message in my heart for you. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you very much. I have a message in my heart. And then we're going to receive the offering at the end. But this morning, I want to talk to you about stretching your faith. Stretching your faith. Somebody say faith. It, in everything that we do as Christians, God always calls us to stretch. Life calls us to stretch. Say amen. 
And in Hebrews 11, it, it, the whole chapter is full of men and women of God who stretch for him. But here in verse 5, it says, By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not have to experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists. Look at this. And that, he's, that he rewards. So how many know God rewards our faith? He rewards those who di diligently or earnestly seek him. And by faith, Noah, verse 7, when warned about things not yet seen in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. And by his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. Now, look at verse 8. Abraham. It says, by faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance. Look at this. He obeyed and he went. Say this with me. Say he obeyed and he went. And this is the faith. He said, even though he did not know where he was going. Come on, somebody. And by faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were his heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city, which foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And this morning, just for a few moments, I want to talk to you about stretching your faith and receiving God's promises in your life. How many want to receive from the Lord today? Amen. Give your neighbor a high five and you may be seated. It's a disco tonight. Look at the disco going. Disco lights are going on. Everybody just say faith. You know, great people of faith have something in common in that they have the ability to see things before they happen. That's what faith is all about. Is is being able to see things before they happen, but not only see it. But to have faith is to be willing to stretch into the areas that God is asking you to go. You can have a vision, but until you're willing to stretch into that vision, that vision is only an idea and that vision is only a concept. And what God is doing in leaders in Victory Outreach, not only here in San Diego, but all over the world, he's not only giving vision, but he's saying I'm looking for people willing to stretch into that vision, stretch into that plan, because when you stretch into it, that's when that vision becomes a reality. Now, people who do this type of stretching in their faith, they become our heroes, don't they? Because these are the type of people that have defeated the odds within their life. These are the type of people we make movies about. These are the type of people who break records and athletics and and, and, and create uh, ideas that we use on our phone or in our life today. These are people who not only saw reality, but were willing to stretch into it. Are you following along with me this morning? You can write a movie or a book about them. In the book of Hebrews 11, it talks about three figures there that stretched out in their faith. But what makes people of faith so great, write this down. Number one is this, is that they don't live in the past. They don't live in the past. I tell you, you'll never get into your future if you're always living in your past. They don't allow the past to affect their future. When they look at their life, they're able to say to themselves, I'm overcoming the odds of my past. I'm overcoming past defeat. I'm overcoming past discouragement. You know, there was a character in the Bible by the name of Jabez. And his name means pain. His mother, you know, didn't see much of a future for him, and she named him Jabez, meaning pain. And, and whether he was birthed in pain or he was a pain in the neck or he was going to be a pain, he refused to take on that title. Come on, help me preach. He refused to take on that title. He refused to take on that label. And he had this prayer where he went before the Lord and he said, Lord, I want you to bless me. And Lord, not only do I want you to bless me, but I want you to enlarge my territory. 
And Lord, I want you to make my name great. They said I'll never be great. They said I'll never accomplish anything. But Lord, I refuse to stay in my past because I serve a God that has given me a future. Isaiah 43 says, forget the former things, for I am about to do a new thing. So we've got to get out of the past. Also, people of faith, great faith, also, they, they live now, but they don't live for the now. There's so many people in this world that are just living day by day. From one crisis to another, from one problem to another, from one situation to another, from one need to another. But people of faith, they live in the now, but they don't live for the now. They're living for a greater future. They're looking not to their now, but they're looking to the promise of God within their life. They keep one eye on the now, because I know God's giving you two eyes. They keep one eye on the now, and they put one eye on the future. That's what you need to do. Yes, you got to live now. Yes, you got to fight the battles of now. Yes, you've got to endure the seasons of now, but never take your eye off the future. Never underestimate, your, uh, underestimate that what you're doing now is be beginning to create something great in your future. Come on, say amen. They, they live with their eyes on the future. A, a person of faith can see the invisible. And that's why in their now they sow and they reap. That's why in their now they don't live rebellious lives. They live lives of obedience to God's word. And when they live obedient lives, they experience miracles. They experience the manifestation of the power of God. See, when, when you read the Bible, how many have your Bible this morning? When you read your Bible, understand that that Bible that you open is a book of miracles. From Genesis to Revelation, it's a book of miracles, miracles that happened in the past, miracles happening in the present, but miracles that God wants to do in the future. And the Bible says he's the same yesterday, today and forever. Say amen. amen. And so when you open up that Bible, it's a, it's a Bible that says you're supposed to defeat the odds. You're supposed to overcome the challenges. It's the David and Goliath book. Can I hear an Amen. It's the book that says that you're a young shepherd boy and you don't have much to offer. And people said nothing good could ever come out of you. But when you stand before Goliath, I got to tell you, the Bible says Goliath has got to come down. So that's what I'm telling you this morning is God wants you to stretch your faith. God wants you to start believing for bigger things in your life. Don't get wrapped up in the now. Don't get wrapped up in the past, but start looking to the future because the best is yet to come. People of faith are willing to stretch. And when you stretch, what does it do? It, it brings an expectation in your life. It brings an expectation in your life. See, for people of faith, it's not about what has happened yesterday. It's not about even what's happening now. And we recognize that yesterday wasn't all bad. There were some good things that God did in the past. There's even some good things that God is doing now. But people in, of faith, they don't just dwell on the past and they don't live in the past. And they don't even just live in the now. Yes, God's doing some good things, but they live a life of expectancy. OK, they live a life of expectancy. I don't know about you, but I want to live on the edge of life's seat. I don't want to sit back and kick back and wait back and settle back. Uh -uh. I can't wait to see what God is about to do. Because if, the God, if God could pull me out of addiction and, and God could pull me out of that depression and God could pull me out of brokenness and God could pull me out of violence and God could pull me out of defeat and bring me to this place, I can't wait to see what God is going to do next in my life. And that's what we need in our leaders here in our church this morning. That's what we need in you. We need some people this morning that are going to stretch into expectancy, start believing for bigger things. Come on, somebody. We need some Jabezes to rise up and say, Lord, it's time to enlarge my territory. It's time to stretch out from the north and the south and the east and the west. Tell your neighbor, stretch your faith. Live on the edge of your seat. Something good is about to happen in your life. Something powerful is about to release in your life. 
He's been seeing your labor. He's been seeing your faithfulness. He's been seeing your consistency. He's been seeing your prayer. He's been seeing you fasting. He's been seeing you preaching the word. He's been seeing you reaching out to people. He's been seeing your disciple. And he says, get ready because I, something good is going to be released in your life. Expect it. Tell your neighbor, expect it. In, in Hebrews 11, I pointed out three men who saw great things. Enoch. By faith, by stretching his faith, he, he, he was willing and able to walk with God. And what happened to Enoch is God took him. He raptured him. He vanished from the earth. And Enoch was a righteous man who, the Bible says, please God. How many of you have a desire to please God? I, I, my prayer is that you don't just come to church for a religious experience to do the, you know, the prototypical sign of the cross and get a little conscience bath on Sunday morning. No, I pray that every time you walk out of this place, you desire to live a life that pleases God. How many of you want to please God with your life? I'll tell you, Enoch is a foreshadowing of things that are going to come. He was the first person taken from the earth. He was actually taken up. The second person to be taken up was Elijah. He was taken in a chariot of fire. But those two men who were taken up, I want to tell you, it's going to happen again. But this time, the Lord is going to take everybody up. Now, if you haven't been living right, you can jump, but you won't go. You're going to be going, mm, 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 and your feet are going to stay on the ground. But there's a group of people that want to please God. There's a church that wants to please God. There's a church that's, that's believing that the Lord is coming back soon. And we're not going to be the only ones to go. Our children are going to go with us. Our families are going to go with us. Come on, mom and dad. Start working with those kids. Start teaching those kids to love God. Start teaching your family to please. Stop pleasing self and start pleasing the Lord so that when the Lord comes back, you don't, you, you don't have to stay back. <laughs> You're going to be like a pogo stick. Jumping. And they're going to say, he's been left behind. You're going to come to church and you're going to be the only one here. Well, there might be a few of you here. But we're going to be gone. Because we were willing to stretch our faith. Tell your neighbor, don't get left back. <laughs> Secondly, by faith, we're talking about these characters Enoch walked with God, stretched his faith, he walked with God. But then Noah worked for God. He worked for God. That's what some of you have been doing. You've just been working for God and working for God. That's what I've been doing. I just got back from a month of working for God and I've been in six hotels this month. Every kind of hotel, you, I've been in a, in a decent hotel. Embassy Suites was decent to a ghetto hotel, to a nice hotel, thank you, Pastor Gary, to a medium hotel, to a nice hotel. And that's work, can I hear an amen? It's not always glamorous going out preaching and encouraging people. You know, you guys are, are pretty easy to preach to. You guys are um, happy people. <laughs> but you go to some churches and preach and Oh, God, they got that I dare you to bless me face. <laughs> you ain't going to bless me no matter what you do. So sweat and shout, and I won't say amen. And, I, and man, that, then you got to go back to a, a lumpy bed in the hotel. That's work. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Eating out every night. But Noah worked for God. How many of you have been working for God? Now, what, 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 what Noah what tells us Noah stretched his face is watch this. Is he worked for God even though he didn't fully understand his mission? How many know that's faith? Faith is working for God when you don't fully understand what the outcome is going to be. Faith is working for God when you don't fully understand if it's going to work for the good or not work out at all. Faith in stretching your faith is working your ground, not knowing the type of harvest you're going to have. So Noah was willing to stretch out and work for God, even though he didn't fully understand the mission. Because you know that Noah had never saw rain before. And God told him, it's going to rain. 
It's going to rain, and, and the rain is going to come. So Noah, get to work. Get to work. Get to work. And so Noah, he went to Home Depot. And he bought a bunch of wood and a bunch of tools, right? And, I, and, he, and he took that stuff home. He had to ship it in. Beep, beep, beep. Brought it in. And, and then he put it on his lawn, right? And, and right there in his neighborhood, he just starts building a boat. He didn't even know what a boat was. He just started building a boat. And, and, and then the people were driving by, and they were probably you know, driving in his neighborhood and seeing him build. And, they, you know, hey, what's that? You know, what are you doing? I'm building a boat. What's a boat? He said, it's going to rain. What's rain? And I'm sure that they made fun of him. And I'm sure they mocked him. See, whenever you stretch out into faith, people without faith are going to come against you. And, and they're going to criticize you. And they say, why do you go to church? And why do you read the Bible? And why do you do this? And why do you do that? And is it working? And, you know, this and that. And what are you a part of? And, and sometimes the enemy wants to discourage you. But I got to tell you something this morning. Just keep on swinging the hammer. You may not fully understand what you're doing, but just look at them and smile and say, rain is coming. <laughs> rain is on its way. I don't know what it's going to look like. I don't know. But rain is coming. God said it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Come on. Don't put down the hammer. Don't put down the saw. Don't put down your tools. Keep on building. Keep on working. Keep on stretching. Keep on doing. Come on, somebody. Keep on doing what God has called you to do. You may not always like it. But keep on doing it. You may not always see the results. But I came to tell you, rain is coming. Rain is coming. Paul said the hardworking farmer is the first to receive the harvest. The lazy guy gets fed last. The hardworking guy gets fed first. Come on, somebody. That's not me. That's the Bible. Don't get mad at me. Look at the Bible. The Lord said the hardworking farmer is the first to reap the harvest. So what am I saying to those of you that have been working your hand to the bone, working your body to the bone, preaching with all your heart, praying until the midnight hour, believing for hard things? Come on, somebody. Is there anybody out there? Here's what I want to tell you. Get ready. Your harvest is on its way. Your rain is about to be poured out. Woo, that's encouraging. Now, if you're here, you say, well, I want some rain, then pick up a hammer and get to work. Look at that wall. That's not just a slogan. That, that's our spirit. We're not here to play church. We're not here to play games. We're here to build. We're building an ark for lost families. We're building an ark for lost people. We're building an ark for drug addicts. We're building an ark for gang members. Oh, come on, somebody. We're building an ark for kids coming out of prison, coming out of the military, coming out of college. We're going to reach them. We're building an ark. We're building a ship. Get up. Get a hammer. Get to work. Because when you work, you will reap. Your harvest will come. And then lastly, Abraham. This is my last point. Did you get something this morning? Abraham is the father of faith. He was the hero of Hebrews 11 because, you know, Noah worked and Abraham was willing to follow the Lord and to stretch out into areas that God called him to stretch out into and to do things that were inconvenient to his life. We live, in a, we live in a day where people want maximum blessing on minimum effort. And what Abraham shows us is that if you want to get blessed, man, you got to get out of your comfort zone. He told him, he says, get out of this land to a land that I will show you. Come on, somebody. And Abraham didn't hesitate to step out on the word and say, Lord, I don't know where I'm going, but I know if you told me it's going to be good, I'm going to follow you till I get there. And that, that required a lot of discomfort and required for him to begin to break out of his comfort zone. I think that's a message for some of you this morning. Some of you are so uncomfortable. It's too, too comfortable. You're really too comfortable. You, you're just comfortable. You're just everything. You look like a big mattress. You don't look like a weapon. You look like a big sofa, like a lazy boy chair. And God wants to stir up your faith this morning, and he wants you to pick up a hammer, and he wants you to go to the place that he has called you to go. He says, because when you go there, you're going to know it's me. 
Abraham got out of his comfort zone. Come on, somebody. And he stepped out, and he was willing to stretch out his borders, stretch out his territory. See, God likes stretching. He likes to stretch things. He likes to break things. He likes to knock walls down. There was a school of the prophets, right? One of the, one of the students went to the prophet and said, the place where we have the place where we dwell, he says, too small for us to allow us to build. Huh? The prophet said, yeah, go ahead. And he said, well, will you go with us? He said, sure, I'll go with you. And, and so he asked for permission to build because the place where they were was too small. Let me tell you something about the places where we dwell, the places where we live. It's not that our rooms shrink. It's that we grow. I remember I was in Covina not too long ago, and I wanted to go by show my kids my old house where I grew up. And we went, and the guy that owned it happened to be in the front yard. I said, I said what are you? I said, what are you just looking at? This is where I grew up. He goes, oh, really? You want to come inside? I go, yeah, let's go in. And so I went into the house. And I'm going to tell you, man, growing up in that house, I remember my room being huge. <laughs> and when I walked into my old bedroom, I swear to God, it was a box. It was the tiniest little, I mean, we used to do WWF in there. We, <laughs> we used to do, drop suplex, drop, drop them off the bunk beds to the top bunk. Come on, somebody. We used to do that, drop the elbow like Hulk Hogan. I mean, we had all kinds of, we did pillow fights in there. We used to be able to squeeze 15 cousins in that room. Come on, somebody, 15 cousins in there. We would be turning the lights off and start punching each other in the face. And, we used to build forts with our Star Wars figures and our G.I. Joes on one side, and then we throw rocks at each other trying to knock down our phone. Come on, somebody. We were moving in that room, and I got into that room, a grown man. I was like, this is the tiniest room i ever seen in my life. Did you shrink the room? But what actually happened is that I had grown. There was a time where I used to come into this room. I used to think, this is big. I think we had about 75 people at that time. You know, 75 grumpy people. Amen. <laughs> grumpy. And I said, this is big, man. This is big. But as time has gone by, especially coming back from Panama this last time, I, I, I came in and this place is small. This building is small. Because why? Because our rooms shrink. Because we grow. And we've grown. We're too big for this now. We're, we're too big for this now. And that's why we're pushing that wall back. How many can't wait to see that wall go back? <laughs> Abraham said, Lord, enlarge my borders. Enlarge my territory. And God says, if you're willing to stretch, you could possess it. That's the final word for you this morning. Maybe Matthew could come, is this. If you'd be willing to stretch, you could possess it. You could possess what you're willing to stretch for. What I, I, I want to tell you, greatness is within your reach. You should write that down. Greatness is within your reach. Greatness is within your reach but you've got to take your hands out your pocket and you've got to be willing to stretch out and get it. Can I hear an amen? He says, God, a carrot dangler? No, God just wants to take you to the next level. But you, you, you've got to do something about it. A person of faith says this, I do what I can and then God does what he can. I do what I can. I, 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 I do what's in the natural and then God does what's in the supernatural. Come on, give God a praise for that. As I close, you may say, well, Pastor Al, what, what sparked this message? Why are you preaching about stretching faith? And I think I'm going to be talking about stretching our faith up till Easter. But I think this, what stirred this message in my heart has been what I've been experiencing within my life as your leader, as your pastor is that the work doesn't stop. The work 
gets stronger. It gets, it gets, it's more urgent. It, it, it becomes faster, more intense, more real. Things that we were talking about 10 years ago are happening now. Things that we would say, man, one day our church is going to be this. One day, we're, well, one day is here. And it is now. You know, one day we're going to make an impact. Okay, that's here and now. One day we're going to finance works around the world. Well, that's here and now. One day we're going to have the resources. It's here and now. One day we're going to plant church. It's here and now. See, it's one thing to plant a church. Now we have to go visit those churches. Now we have not just plant it. Now we have to go and we have to encourage those babies that we're having. Come on, somebody. And we got to give them some money too. Can I hear an amen? And, and now it's that, you know, we're not, a, we're not a bunch of, we don't create bastards. We're raising children. Come on, somebody. It's easy to have a baby, but can you raise that child? And so we are going out now and having to take care of the works that we've planted. And it's a beautiful thing. Everything we've prayed for is starting to happen. But the question I have is, are you on that journey too? This is not the time for anybody in our church to start getting their own vision. This is not the time for anybody in our church to start, you know, getting their own vision and start pulling away. Because I'll tell you this. It's more than money. Some people, they say, oh, uh, I don't go to Victor's because all they want is your money. Actually, I got some bad news for you. We, we don't want your money. We want everything. <laughs> we want your gift. We want your talent. We want your body in church on Sunday. <laughs> We want you here Wednesday night, Friday night, Saturday. We, we don't just want your money. Yes, we want your money, but we want everything about you. <laughs> you know, if you struggle with the money thing, you ain't going to make it here because we want everything. Because if we're going to reach the world, it's more than money. We need your prayers. We need your prayers directed towards the projects. Come on, somebody. We've got projects. I'm, I'm going into Panama. I'm going to help Pastor Sonny and Sister Julie in Panama. I'm going to be a point leader in Panama. You notice nothing has happened with those rehabs in the East Coast? Well, guess what? This week, Pastor Al, now it's your job. You're going to plant the rehabs in the East Coast. I'm taking on that ministry now, and that's what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to need your help. And all that is on top of we're building a building. All of that is on top of we're trying to raise up leaders here. All of that is on top of we have churches calling all the time. Can you come pray? Can you come minister? Can you have the music team come and teach our and, 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 and I can't afford to have any of you going on weird trips. There's too much work to be done. I need you to align yourself with the calling that is on this church. Now, if people want to leave, then let them leave. I don't want them to go to hell. But I can't chase leaders that had a bad slice of pizza and are getting a weird dream. We need leaders that are going to be like Abraham, and they're going to hear from God. They're going to hear from God. And they're going to say, Pastor, we see that you're out there. Not, I mean, you know, you see me having played a golf here and there. You know, I might have a round of golf. Well, a lot of stuff happens on the golf course. You know, it, it's a lot of business, talking, connecting with people. It's important, building relationships. So you're eating at restaurants. Well, a lot happens at restaurants. You're fellowshipping. You're talking business with pastors and leaders. And you're making deals and you're helping people. So fellowship is important. God, I get tired of eating out. Sometimes you want to have that home-cooked meal, don't you? You want to be home and you want to, but it's work. Someone say it's work. You can stand with me. Or be seated, be seated. 
we're going to receive the giving. And I share this with you because a lot's happening. One of the major things that's happening right now in your midst, in your midst, how many into this message? Is that one of the major things happening in your midst right now is that the people that are stretching are being blessed. Now, um, it's not hype. I'm not here to hype you up. But I do want to share with you that there are people that took the pledge and, and they received the pledge and they stepped out to do uh, gifts that they've never done before. Uh, which is called uh, extravagant giving. Because we need all the finances to come in and it's coming in. I'm very, oh God, I'm so encouraged. I'm so excited. We're going to give out some hammers right now. But some people are telling me, Pastor, you know, I stepped out to do a big pledge I had never done before. And God blessed me. One person came to me and said, God gave me a raise of $20,000. <laughs> I said, 20000 I said, that's the type of blessing I need in my life. Another person came up to you just the other day and said, Pastor, I need to talk to you. It, it was funny, 20000 They had got blessed with 20000 also, and they, and they were going to buy a house. I said, wow, that's amazing. Different things are happening in people's lives, but it's the ones that are stretching out. And, and that's why I want to ask you, how are you doing on your pledge? How are you doing? Because I see that God is blessing his people right now. And when the waters are stirring, it's important that we jump in those waters. It's important that we get in there and we begin to do what the Lord has asked us to do. Because God said, I want to bless you. God's also opening up ministry opportunities for those who've been faithful and committed you heard about San Diego State. Now, Pastor Chris had said about the young adults and they're the best kept secret in the church. You know. And I think it's better to say this. We don't want them to be the best kept secret anymore. These events going into San Diego State, that's not a little event. That's a big deal. And how many as a church, we should get behind that. And we should fill that place up. Come on, somebody. So young adults, you guys can't lay in the cut no more. It's time to come out of your cave and get the church behind you. Different things are happening. Different opportunities are opening up. I mentioned the rehab. I mentioned the different works that God is calling us to help with. That's because God is saying, I want to give San Diego more. How many of you want to be effective for God? Come on, let me see. How many want to be effective for the Lord? We're, we got the opportunity right now. And we need to stretch. I, I think for the first time I'm starting to feel this. I'm done. I'm done. I don't like to be presumptuous in anything that I say or do. I am dramatic. And I am charismatic in that way. But there are things that I will be careful about. One of the things that I have been very careful about saying to our church throughout the years is something that I'm about to say to you now. And I have never really wanted to mention it. But the more I go out, the more I see, the more we work here. That When I look at the doors, we're going to be with the mayor again, doing that another event with the mayor this year. We'll be leading uh, the National Day of Prayer in National City May 1st. Come on, somebody. All these things are happening. And the people I'm meeting and the places I'm going and the doors that are opening, I want to say this to you. For the first time I feel that Victor Eric San Diego, that God is going to move this church into being a mega church. A mega church. Do you believe it? Do you see the signs of it happening? And you're going to be the people that are going to lead this thing. You know that? That's why I don't want you to get disgruntled. And say, oh, well, what's going to happen, Pastor? Things going to change? Well, there's always got to be change. But what we're going to keep is we're going to keep the spirit of family. The spirit of family. Because how many know that's one of our values? And no matter how big we get, we're a family. No matter how big we get, we're a family. We could get to 2,000, we're going to stay a family. 
3,000, we're going to stay a family. No matter what we're going to do, we are going to stay a family in Victory Outreach. How many, how many want to be a part of a ministry like that? But we're going to be an effective family. We're not going to be a dead, boring family. We're going to be an effective family for the Lord. So what I want to do today is I want to receive the tithes and the offering. Did you receive this message today? Was it good? And I want to receive the tithes and offering this morning. We, we're short on time. And we have some hammers to give out too. But if you have your tithing envelope or United We Can, you mean United We Can, lift up your hand if you need an envelope. You also have your phone ready. And I want to give out the golden hammers. Do we have them? I don't see any. Well, that's in the next service. Oh, great. So I got a little bit of time. I want to receive the giving. Now, if you haven't made a real heavy uh, uh, thrust in your pledge, don't wait too much longer now. We, we're running out of time. We only have about four weeks left to get this money in. People are calling and saying, when does it do? April 21st. So that's just a few weeks away. We're already in April. And we need that money to come in. You say, well, what's happening? I don't see nothing happening. Well, open up your eyes, little puppet. Amen, and you'll be able to see this. <laughs> come on, little puppet. Wake up, man. The sound booth, we moved it. It's going over there. We had to break that down. Um, this week, they're going to be cutting a three-foot trench in front of the building, and they're going to be x-raying everything underneath the sanctuary. They want to look at all the things that are going on underneath the building so that we, you know, we, we push the wall. We don't, it doesn't collapse. Hello, somebody. That would be bad. They're going to x-ray all that. Um, we've made a lot of electrical changes. We, we dealt with the sound. We made some sound changes. We had to spend some money on that because we want to prepare. And we got some really great news yesterday that um, we were getting ready to start the application for submittal to the city. And when we went in, they said, wait a minute, wait a minute. You guys are Victor Outreach? Yeah, we're Victor Outreach. Okay. You don't need to do the application. In fact, you don't have to go through step one. You don't got to go through step two. We're going to take you right into step three. Amen. Come on, somebody. And that's a preliminary review. So we didn't have to pay for the application. Thank you, Jesus. We didn't have to pay for the second step. Thank you, Jesus. Save some money. Because when you give, God always makes a way. And now into the third phase. And here's what we're praying. We're praying that we're going to get favor with the city. That we may not even have to go to planning. We found out that some of the people that work at planning drive by our building every day. They get off the freeway and they drive right here. 90,000 cars drive in front of our building. 90,000 souls every month drive in front of our church. And they say, we know Victor Outreach. We know what's happening there. We know God is doing a good work. Come on, somebody. So how many know all we have to do is do our part, and then God will do his part. Are you ready to see that happen? Ready to see that happen?